In 2008, the Supreme Court decided the case District of Columbia versus Heller. And in that decision, they found an individual judicially enforced right, totally separate from service in the military, for individuals to own guns in their home for self-defense. And also it stated that self-defense is a primary component of the Second Amendment. So what the court had done, they discovered a statutory right out of the ambiguous phrases of the Second Amendment that had never been discovered by the Supreme Court in the 200 years uh, since the amendment had been formed. The decision is a five to four one, uh, and uh, Justice Scalia writes the majority opinion. And it's clear from his statements and what he says in the public that this decision was based upon originalism. Now, originalism is a theory of interpreting law and the Constitution that's basically composed of two elements, intent and meaning. Scholars who focus on the intention of the founders do just that. That's their, that's their focus. That's what they view as to be important. Those who talk of intent or look at meaning, we'll call textualists because they, in, they, they focus on the text of the laws that are written. And primarily what they want to discover is the meaning that folks at the time recognized to be legitimate. Well, what we must understand is the validity or legitimacy of an originalist interpretation rests entirely, entirely and completely upon the legitimacy, value, and sophistication of the historical research upon which it rests. So the Heller decision gives us a wonderful opportunity of a case study to find the relationship between an originalist interpretation and the historical research upon which it rests. Scalia, in his decision, claims that the crafting of the Second Amendment is of dubious interpretive worth. Well, that's an astounding statement for a textualist to make. I mean, the creation of the very text that he thinks he has a definitive hold on is ignored. So, I think it's obvious that if we want to understand the Second Amendment, we have to see how it's created. And if we t Let me just take a minute to, to go over the creation of the Second Amendment. <clears throat> the amendments are given over to James Madison and the committee in Congress. And his first draft reads, the right of the citizens to uh, keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, semicolon. Uh, a well-regulated militia is essential to the security of a free state, semicolon. And uh, those religi religiously opposed uh, in principle will not be forced to serve uh, in person. <clears throat> well, when this goes to the full house, there are changes made. First of all, the first thing they do is eliminate that proviso about uh, religious uh, qualms. Why do they do that? because they're afraid the central government will determine who is religiously opposed and disbar them from serving in the militia as a means of disarming state militias. There's that problem between the central government and the states. Next, Congress reverses the order. It begins with a well-regulated militia, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And they add to the militia composed of the whole body of the people. You know, a textualist believes that every word in the amendment is important. Well, every punctuation is important too. And to eliminate semicolons means that there, these are not separate ideas that are being put together. By creating a comma, they make the, the, uh, the well-regulated militia a preamble. And it's clearly understood in the 1790s by judges, by attorneys, by intelligent laymen, that the preamble designates the design and meaning and intent of the, of the legislation. The comma joins them, so there's not the separation. They're all a part of the same whole. One can't exist without the other. Now, when this goes to the Senate, the Senate immediately eliminates the phrase composed of the whole body of the people. 
Now that's, that's vitally important. If a textualist believes that every word in the amendment is significant, words that are there and are then taken out are significant too. Because the Senate had a clear option to leave that phrase in or take it out. They chose to take it out. Now the significance of that is all of the publications we've had in the last several decades, the people who believe in individual rights and the people who believe in the gun activists, that's vitally important to them to believe that the militia is composed of the whole body of the people because then the whole body of the people can be joined or be a part of the militia and you can't take their guns away from them. That's, a, that's, a, that's their right. Scalia in, a, in a, a book of his, A Matter of Interpretation, states that textual analysis depends above all else upon context. And yet he and the majority pass over the discussion of the creation of the, of the, of the amendment and pass over also the discussion of the amendment once it's been written. Well, if, we, if you look at the discussion of the, of the amendment, the context becomes crystal clear. The context is the same as almost all the discussions in the early Congresses. It involves federalism, a struggle over federalism, a struggle between the central government and the states. Now, no historian would deny that English common law talks about the rights of people to be armed or uh, doesn't or would not uh, deny that Americans were firmly convinced that they had a right to bear arms. But the point of it is, this never played a role in the discussion. The discussions are solely and completely about the militia. There's not a word, not a sentence spoken about an individual's right to bear arms in self-defense. What are we left with? We're left with an anachronistic interpretation of the Second Amendment resting on terribly faulty historical analysis offered under the auspices of originalism.